Hey there, I just wanted to take a second to say thank you so much for watching this episode of The Shepherd Station. If you feel this has added some value to your life, it would mean so much to us if you would share this episode with someone else. It helps us so much when you do that. It would go a long way in supporting our mission to help men become better fathers, husbands, and leaders. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and give us a like. If you're listening to us through Spotify or Apple Podcasts or, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts, follow us, leave us a review, and let us know how we're doing. We want to hear from you. All right, that's all I've got. Now, let's get back to the episode. Welcome back, everybody. We're here at the Shepherd Station. We're coming to you from 24 East Church Street at the Stockyard in Headland, Alabama. Great food, great sandwiches, great drinks. Come by and see us. We really want to hang out with you. We have a really good show today. Thomas over here, Andy over here. Um, we have Dr. Olivia Johnson uh, on the show today. She is a former Air Force, uh, I'm sorry, she's an Air Force veteran, uh, law enforcement veteran, and she has done a lot of work in the area of uh, suicide inside law enforcement, done a lot of research in that. Andy sat there and, and uh, again, it's one of the contacts that this man can make. I don't know how he does it. Uh, you know, I've known him for a long time. I just don't know how he does it, but he's, he's great at finding these contacts. And he brought her to the show today. Yeah, this is a, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff that's kind of really close to me. I, I really think that we need to discuss it on a, on a grand level because it's a problem inside law enforcement. Uh, she is a very, very strong woman of faith. And with all that being said, Andy, your guest, man. Yeah. Dr. Johnson, we're glad to have you today. I'm just going to call you Olivia, though, because uh, we, we've talked a couple of times on the phone and had a couple of in-depth conversations. And uh, Olivia is really passionate about her job and about her role and about her mission. It's really not a job or a, or a role. It's a mission and it's a calling. And uh, we've had a couple of uh, pretty in-depth conversations of, about what she's doing. And uh, glad, ha glad to have her on the show today. And, and not only suicides in law enforcement, but in first responder jobs in general. I know her research is, is more geared toward law enforcement. But, you know, we I've talked to a lot of firefighters, too, that have seen a lot of bad things in their careers. And, and EMTs also that have issues uh, with depression and with suicide and that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, suicide to me has always been one of those. It's been the one thing out of my career that's kind of, I'm not going to say haunted me, but it's one of those things that I can still see every suicide that I've ever been to. Yeah. And I've often wondered, what was this person thinking the last fraction of a second before they pulled the trigger or before they stepped off of a bucket with a rope around their neck or they took some pills or whatever the case may be? And, uh, and those weren't even the law enforcement suicides. Those were just, the, you know, everyday people ones that I've been to. And, and, you know, people look to law enforcement as their savior, as their heroes, as the, the, the tough people, the ones who uh, are out there withstanding uh, a lot of violence and that kind of thing. But I think those things are probably what contributes to a lot of law enforcement suicides because people, uh, they just can't deal with the things that we see every day. And I've, I've said on this podcast before, my dad was a cop for 36 years, and he told me one time, he said, son, you'll always have your friends from high school. You always have your buddies you went to college with. But other cops will be your truest and closest friends because only they know what you go through on a daily basis. And I found that to be quite true over the years during, during my career. But Olivia, I want to talk to you this morning. Tell us a little bit about your research and how you got involved in researching uh, suicide and law enforcement. And let's talk about some of the causative factors. We just want to give you a platform because we want to help people. We want to make sure that we're getting the word out that there is help out there and you don't have to suffer alone. And we want to make sure that if we could wish we could stop suicides in general, but if we could stop law enforcement suicides today, we would do whatever it took to do that. So we want to hear from you this morning and, and uh, tell us about your platform and what led you into this field. Sure. No, I appreciate that, Andy, and the rest of you guys. I thank you for having me on. Um, so while I was working in law enforcement, I actually, we had a, a, the only other female in my academy class was actually killed in a vehicle accident. I actually went down that road for quite a while, wondering why we were speeding the calls, not wearing seatbelts, going too fast for conditions. The more I looked, I started actually uncovering suicide cases, which I thought was kind of odd. So you're, this is back in 2003, 2004. And I'm like, man, that's kind of odd. Why am I finding all these cases? I started asking people, you know, were you aware that we had these suicides? And most people were unaware that suicide was ever an issue. Now, it's not an epidemic. 
Um, it has not been an epidemic when you have a million officers nationwide. However, it is the leading cause of death, which is why we look at it. So I realized very quickly that my calling was to go down that road. So I actually left my entire dissertation on the on the other side. I left it and I started a new one. Um, and I sadly, I got resistance for quite a while. I got resistance when I called to do research. I got, Olivia, we don't have a problem. Appreciate what you're doing, but we're moving on. And many of them had no idea. Even the high-ranking people in the agency had no idea suicide was an issue. So we we went down this road probably for about a year. I would call. They didn't want, you know, they didn't want anything. They didn't want to do any research, didn't have any how, issues. How long ago was that? Um, that would have been in 2005, 2006, and be even beyond <clears throat> then. I would get like, hey, we don't have any issues, thanks, but no thanks. And I said, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Well, here's what happened. About six months after that, I started getting phone calls and it was, hey, Olivia, we had a suicide. We need you. And I'm like, time out. <laughs> About the third <laughs> yeah. call, I said, this is not how it works. I said, you guys cannot call me after the fact. I am not a magician. I can change nothing for you. And I said, it, the, the whole the whole mindset here is we are in a prevention mode. And here's what prevention is. Prevention is you have a suicide. You don't want it to happen again. We say that's not working because guess what? You're going to continue to have suicides. And it's been proven. The numbers have gone up every year since I've done my research. They're almost at 50,000 right now. I started over 28,000. They go up whoa, every whoa, single whoa, year. 50,000 total law enforcement total suicides. across the no, country. Total suicides nationwide. Now, okay. total suicides law enforcement nationwide. is okay, a small piece of that pie, but the suicide numbers in general, they get reported mm. to your normal coroner medical examiner's office and mm. they go through your state and then they go up to your CDC and your World Health Organizations. But the idea is those numbers go up every year. We're no different. We're a piece of that pie. Right. We're a piece of that pie. And that's assuming that it gets, you know, it gets logged in correctly, which there are many times there are issues there. But the problem is, is that these numbers continue to go up and nobody wants you in their PD to do training until they have a suicide. That's okay, well where that, we need to change it. So that, that's something that, you know, I started looking into it a very little bit because I wanted it to be a suggestion that we had on this show because I want to bring that what law enforcement officers go to for the people that do listen that don't have an, a law enforcement background or a first responder background. So in 23, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you can probably tell me better. It's, uh, I think there was either 120, between 120 to 125 reported suicides in law enforcement. Is that correct? That's because to me, not that's correct. That and, sounds... and though I do believe, like you said, it's underreported, the yeah. idea is what gets reported to the medical examiner's office depends on what you're doing at that time. So let's say you're a retired officer and the last job you had was working at Walmart as a greeter. You're not going to mm. be listed as law enforcement. You're going to be listed as your last job. So there's a lot of issues with reporting. But even on the high end, you know, we could have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 suicides a year, and it's still not considered an epidemic, right? But yeah. what we said is, if it's a leading cause of death, just like when we, you know, I went to the FBI years ago and said, listen, you know, the Leoka stuff, law enforcement officers killed and assaulted, we need to add suicide in there because it's part of the issue. Um, it's a leading cause of death. And it was just deaf ears, you know, deaf ears. So we said, okay, I'm not waiting anymore for an invitation. We're going to do our own thing. So in 2016, at the end of 2016, starting of 2017, I had been doing research in suicide for, for all this time up from like 2008 until 2017, but I had not collected cases, if you will. I knew that there was a problem. I didn't, I could prove it any day of the week, but I said, we got to start doing something different. So I started the National Law Enforcement Suicide Mortality Database, and that collects 122 data points on each case. Right. We pull autopsy, toxicology, police report. I go back on social media up to a year on any social media site I can find. I look for any litigation, any pending you know, lawsuits, any any kind of issue an officer might have been involved in family life. We do a psychological autopsy on every case. We get interviews sometimes from family, friends, coworkers, spouses. We put that all together into a case file and it gives us the what we came up with was called the fatal 10. And these were the 10 common factors noted in law enforcement suicide, either by themselves or in conjunction with other factors that actually increased one's risk for suicide. And, you know, the, and the leading one that we noted was relationship issues. They, they, the majority of our cases were facing pending relationship breakups, divorce, um, you know, those kind of things were happening in that relationship. And then we saw the substance use, right? So those kind of started going hand in hand. What kind of substance and, uh, use when, were you when we looked at that? Of? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What kind of substance? Uh, what kind of substances were you running into? I mean, I know obviously alcohol. 
Yeah, alcohol was huge. We had a, we had a couple cases that were like six six times the legal limit at time of death, and alcohol did not kill Whoa. them. Whoa! Uh, yeah. Now, listen, you don't get there overnight. You don't get yeah. to that overnight. That is someone who is a very heavy drinker for a very, very long time because mm-hmm. you can't build up that kind of tolerance. In fact, people that have a BAC <sighs> that high can actually have a BAC of like 0.1, 0.2 on yeah. a daily basis without drinking initially because it doesn't yeah. wear off that quickly. Yeah. Wow. So right. there are many issues going on here. We had fentanyl in the system. We had opioids in the system. There were cases where officers had actually stolen drugs on, you know, when they went out on calls. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them was pending an IA investigation because he had stolen like hundreds of pills because he was addicted. And Mm -hmm. this is the dirty little secret piece here, right? This is one of them anyway. And what I say that is, I love my men and women in uniform. I appreciate what they do. But the truth is from our research, the job is not it's a piece of the pie, but it's not the big piece that everybody mm-hmm. thinks it is. Many people want to say it's the job and PTSD, but what we found in our research, it is the stress and trauma piece, but that might mean it's childhood trauma, right? Your ACEs stuff, adverse childhood experiences. And then it's how you deal with that stress and trauma that leads to other issues. And what, what do cops do? They drink. And, and I couldn't believe the cases. And when we looked at toxicology reports that had numerous drugs in their system at time of death, stuff they should never even have access to, illicit, mm-hmm. over-the-counter prescription. Um, and, and when you look at this, you're going, what in the world is happening here? Like, what is happening here? Um, and we don't want to talk about that. Everybody talks about the shame of mental health, but the truth is not all of these cases are mental health related, number one. You can be in a crisis and not have a mental health issue. And part of the problem is we don't want to talk about those dirty little things that happen behind closed doors because those are shameful. Those bring a bad light on somebody. But when we can understand what's going on in your life and why you got to here and what happened along the way that put you at risk, that's how we change how we train and educate those in the field and the family members on those real issues. And nobody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that, you know, one of our fatal 10 is being under investigation. Mm. And that group is small. Let me tell you, that group is small. But the majority in that group were in that group because they were doing bad things with kids, child sexual deviant crimes. And nobody wants to touch that. They don't want to talk about it. And it's like, listen, guys, we have to talk about the good and the bad. We can't blame everything on the job and we can't say everything was PTSD and blanketed because that, number one, does not fix anything. And it doesn't provide the right answers and the right solutions to the problems that we have. We need to start looking at how we're vetting people coming into the field, right? I I have people right now that will argue and say, Olivia, oh my gosh, we're so low on people. We're just going to be digging bottom of the barrel soon. I said, going to be. I said, listen, folks, let's not be dismayed here. We have people in this field that should not be here. And I can prove that to you every day of the week, too. And they make the men and women out there doing the right thing look bad. They, they wow. it, it is what it is. We have wolves in sheepdog clothing. Let's just put it like that. Mm-hmm. They're out right. there. And we have people that do take their lives because they're going, they're going to face criminal charges or face jail time. And, and that exists. But nobody wants to talk about that piece of the pie. And it's yeah. like you can't you can't pick and choose and cherry pick what you want to talk about because this may not make you look good. Because you want the you want the community to humanize these guys and gals behind the badge, right? You want them to be humanized. But as soon as they become too human, we can't talk about it anymore. Mm-hmm. And, so and we've that, got to stop doing that. You do. You're, you're telling me that it's being underreported because departments are trying to hide the information because they don't want a bad light brought on themselves. Well, wow. Departments, families. Now, listen, we have right. off. I, I had mm-hmm. an agency that said that they were going to honor this individual who died by suicide because they were just a great person and did nothing to look into why the suicide occurred. Not one mm-hmm. thing. And I said, you know, you you can't just blanket statement and say, well, they were good at work because you don't know what's happening behind closed doors. I had a murder suicide where the individual, they were two beloved people in the community. The husband killed the wife. And the first comments from the people in the agency were, God, he was such a good guy. And I thought maybe you should live. Listen, if you're not living with these people behind closed doors, you don't know what's going on. You don't know the struggles that they have. You don't know the family issues that they have, because most of the time we're not sharing in depth at work those issues. You're not going to go on like, you know, show up Monday morning and be like, dude, uh, we got so drunk last night. I busted his tooth and he gave me a black eye. We got to really quit drinking so early in the day. Nobody does that. And yet wow. that's happening behind closed doors. Yeah. yeah. Olivia, yeah. Oli- oh, you're, <clears throat> you know, I've listened to a lot of different people talk about law enforcement suicide. Uh, and as we were talking before we started recording this podcast this morning, there's a lot of organizations out there that are just saying the same old thing over and over and over again. But 
What's different about you is you're saying a lot of stuff that I've never heard before yeah. mm-hmm. as a causative, causative factors of suicide. You're not blaming the job, the PTSD and the trauma that's seen daily solely for law enforcement right. suicides like a lot of organizations Actually do. They want to blame not the number one. Yeah, they want to well, blame the job, the job for it. Yeah, because we all have choices in life. I've mm-hmm. had a cop tell me I am an alcoholic for 30 years because of the job. I like time out. You got to walk me back from this one. He's like, mm-hmm. well, I saw a lot of bad shit. I said, we all see a lot of bad stuff. Yeah. Right. And I like my beer. Don't get me wrong. But I said, you made a choice to start drinking. If you made a choice to start working out and you became a bodybuilder, you would never credit the job for making you a bodybuilder. It's all <laughs> right. you. So I said, you got to stop this mindset that you're a victim. I said, we don't operate mm. well in victim mode. You know, the, the truth is we all have choices in life. And I hate to say it, but suicide is a choice. You know, mm-hmm. you don't just not wake up one day. We all have to sit back for a moment and go, listen, we need to take that personal accountability early on. And what we do different is this, you know, Desmond Tutu had talked about, and I posted this the other day on social media, you know, we go down to the, we see the guy at the bottom of the river pulling bodies out and, and we need to go up to the front and find out where they're jumping. And I said, well, let's, let's look at this picture for a moment. The guy pulling bodies out of the water at the end of the river, that's reactive. That's your suicide prevention at its best. That's, we had a suicide. We don't want another one. The guy at the top of the river wondering why they fell in in the first place. That's, that's reactive again. That's a psychological autopsy. Now that has a place in here, which is exactly what we do, but it has to be more than that. So we said, wait a minute, why are we even letting people get close to the edge of the river if they're not, if they don't know how to swim and they don't, you know, they're not inoculated against the issues that they're going to face. So we keep them away from the water until they have a vest on. And the idea isn't that they're not going to have problems, that they're not going to fall in or that they're not even going to drown. The problem is, is this. They're going to have less problems if we inoculate them against these fatal 10 things that are causing their death in the first place by suicide or putting them at risk, right? They're still going to have issues, but they're not going to be as catastrophic as they would be without a life vest on. You might Mm -hmm. fall in the river. You might get bruised and battered. You might hit some tree limbs. You're going to have issues, but you're not going to be dead and you're going to have quality of life. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the whole idea here is the inoculation paradigm is if I know that these 10 things are going to put you at risk for negative outcomes to include suicide, then we inoculate you against those so that you don't have these issues in the future. And here's how we operate now. Sorry. We give you, and did you, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I love, you are just so chock full of information. This is so (laughs) good. Um, But I have told people as a pastor for a very long time that exact same thing, that the best way to win a battle is to not have to go to battle at all. Right. And that's what it's you're like doing. It's like having de-escalation training but not having to use it. It's, yeah. it's like it's really it's being prepared and hoping it, it's really not you don't want to hope, but it's preparing for something that you hope you never have to use. Yes, exactly. And it's the same thing with sin, not to get too spiritual here, but it's the same thing with all of it is like if you struggle yes. with something or if there's an issue, you you want to eliminate the threat from yes. the beginning. Oh, yes. You know, um, you don't yeah. want to you don't want to go to the edge of that line and see how far you can, you can get. Right. And there are too many people that do that. And you're saying they do that in the suicide prevention world, too. It's like they were like, oh, we're going to we're going to find out all the things we got to do after the fact. It's like, no, you got to, you got to prevent this from the beginning, fight the battle before the battle's ever begun. That's a good oh, warrior. Yeah. That's a well, good leader. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's the whole point is warriors know what they're up against and they, and they take care of that before it ever happens. Exactly. We've got to stop calling ourselves warriors. If we're not willing to go up against what we know that we're yeah. facing, we have yeah. to be honest with all of it, including who we are at our core. And you know, everything that runs on prevention right now, we, and, and if I could do a Ted talk, my Ted talk title is suicide prevention is dead wrong. And there's a reason for that. We wait till people are in crisis and then we go, Hey, here's a 10 digit phone number to call. Okay. I want you to just, I have, I I can't help you. Here's a number to call. And then they go, wait a minute. That number was just too hard for you. Remember, let me give you a three digit code 988, which most people don't know anymore. They can't, they can't get the number right. It's three digits. I said, listen, the number isn't the problem. You're waiting for people to be in crisis who have high stress right now. They're self-medicating. They're not using problem-solving abilities because if they were, they wouldn't be calling into your number to begin with. And they're not thinking clearly. And you're expecting these people to make good, articulate decisions when they're under stress. It's not going to happen. Nothing has changed. In fact, our numbers continue to go up. We don't get the return on investment in saving lives from the suicide numbers, right? They, they, they just keep going up. And what do we keep doing? Well, let's put a billboard out. Let's put all of our money together and let's put a flyer out. It's like, listen, this stuff has a place, but you're putting too much money into this and it's not giving a return on investment in saving lives in record numbers. So at what point 
do you keep throwing money at this monster or at what point do you say enough's enough and let's do something different? And we have we have offered this to major organizations and yet we are up against we won't get our grant money. We won't get our grant money. If it doesn't say suicide prevention, I said, at what point do these people have dollar signs on their backs? And how many of them are you willing to throw away every year so that you get your grant money when the so, whole idea is to save lives? So, again, we're being driven by the dollar. Oh, uh, everything's driven by the dollar. Yeah, it's driven <laughs> by the dollar. You don't worry about the lives. You drive, You know, why are we not going to get our money? No. And that, that really bothers me. You know, I've said for years and years, you know, we will train and you know, I'm going to be specific to the law enforcement field or even the military field, whatever, but we will train on how to deal with the threat, right? We'll train on how to go into that building and clear that building and be safe, how to be proficient with a firearm. We will train on how to potentially take a life and, and let's call it what it is. I mean, in the law enforcement field, you know, we see horrible things on a daily basis, but one of the worst things that you can do is have to take a life. Um, but we don't give the guys and the, and the ladies in the field the tools, or I haven't seen it, you know, in 30 years to the level that it needs to be. We don't give them the tools to deal with, I don't know how, I'm put, how, I don't know how to put this the right way. We don't prepare them for what comes after. Yeah. I don't know if that oh, makes no, sense. We, you're absolutely right. We don't talk about any of that. Like we say, this is what your job is. And then we send them out there and we hope for the best. And the truth is, even when you, if you had to kill somebody in the line of duty, it was completely justified. It's still the loss of life. And when you're sitting around drinking because you are in this in traumatic and stressful event, and you're now starting to think about your purpose and why you're here and that you're supposed to protect people and you took a life and all of these things start coming in, you, you don't know how to take that. And then you might be getting an award for it. And you're like, I just like, you know, like there's all these things going through your mind and people can't deal with that because we don't talk enough about a solid foundation, number one, in their faith and what they believe in, having some kind of spiritual foundation that bad stuff's going to happen to you during your career and being able to make sense of it now, right? Again, that's the inoculation piece. I know that when I was working, if I had to take someone's life, I was prepared to do it if I had to. And I was also prepared spiritually with my religious background that said, listen, there's a reason that I have to do what I do and I'm going to be okay if I have to do it, but I have to prepare ahead of time to make sure that I could deal with the, uh, you know, the, the after effects, if you will, of people not liking my decision, people having a problem, you know, Monday quarterbacking everything. May I ask you a question based on what you um, just said, because you used the term in their faith. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Andy and I both worked for an organization. I'm not going to name the organization. We're not really supposed to, but we worked for an organization inside the, uh, uh, well, we'll say inside the army where we were teaching and contract instructors. But the, one of the driving things for that organization was keep the faith. And at the time, you know, this was what, how long ago was that? It was in 2006. Six, something like seven. that. So at the time it wasn't, I mean, you don't hear people talking about faith that much anymore. <laughs> so that, that was the whole thing, keep the faith. I think that needs to be driven to law enforcement is you've got, you have to have a moral code. Obviously our moral code, my moral code is Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that center, if you don't have that driving you, I, I guess the question is, is how, how much of the suicide stuff do you see is, um, the individual was lacking in that area? Well, and how we can't track a lot of the belief systems, if you will, mm -hmm. on the ideologies of people, but mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. Do Christians die by suicide? Yes, right? They yeah. have struggles and they do. So we don't know what their religious affiliation, if any, was. But I will but tell do you, you think that. It's a lower, you as, think it's a lower percentage, though? Christians are definitely a, Christians are definitely lower percentage of suicides yeah. than the general population? Uh, yeah, and I mean, <laughs> because you know, with belief, certain belief systems, there are belief systems that people that die by suicide won't go to heaven, and there are certain things right. that people believe as perceptions. But yeah. Um, we didn't look at that in particular in our research, but I will tell you this, um, there, there becomes this idea that when we took those fatal 10 and we kind of condensed them down we came up with what we call relational purpose and your purpose, you know, when you talk about being a sheepdog or a warrior or a first responder, your purpose is to protect and serve at its very core. You have this idea of what you think you're doing when you go there and that starts to become eroded in your belief system. So whether it's a faith-based or it's just a religious, like a component of spirituality even, right? 
right? That you just have this belief system that starts to fall apart when you're not practicing what you think you should be doing, or if you're, you're having issues in your life and you're not practicing that for me, that was when, when you look kind of like at a, at a T here, that's the top for me because that made decisions for me when, you know, good decisions are being made when no one else is there, that I have a spiritual background, that my beliefs don't change every time I have a case or every time something bad happens. You get a lot of cops now that question, well, where's God when these little kids are dying and bad things are happening? My like, God was always here. Mm-hmm. You just have to, you, you have to have faith and you have to have a belief system that helps you make sense of everything before those bad things happen. Because yeah. if every time you have something happen, you question why you're never going to get through that one nor get through the next one and you're no good to anybody. And that's what starts happening is whatever belief system they had wasn't strong enough. It wasn't based on a solid foundation and it didn't hold the test of time. And after a while, that sand started to erode with everything else coming down. It started to erode away and then there was nothing. Let me ask you this, Olivia. What, What percentage, and you can break this down as far as law enforcement and then we can go a little bit you know, take it a little further out and it's just like first responders and military also, but what percentage of the law enforcement or first responder military community is, uh, does suicide reflect uh, in regards to the general population? That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I mean, how, how well, does it look are, against the general yeah, population? There are some studies that say it is higher, um, and this is from years ago too, and then some that say it's right around the same. But, you know, again, you're looking at two different populations and you're looking at mm-hmm. two different, you know, when, you, when you're comparing those kind of things, it's not necessarily apples. and It is kind of apples and oranges. You're looking at different pieces. But the, the first responder population is slightly higher. But again, when you're looking at first responders, you also have to be really clear. What are you looking at? So for us, when we looked at our numbers, we were strictly doing law enforcement and corrections. We were doing active sworn, retired, and former. And, and you know, people go, well, why not all first responders? Well, number one, it's timely and it's very expensive to pull records. Mm-hmm. At, at some point, it gets very expensive. Yeah. So you have to be really clear when we say first responders, what does that mean? Who is actually being included in that? And most of the research actually shows just law enforcement compared to the general population, not all first responders. Because then you start pulling in, if you pull in the military, that's going to make a huge mm-hmm. difference, right? And even yeah. with the military, Um, You know, the majority of military suicides that we have, they've never left American soil. Everybody wants to believe it's these people that have went overseas. They've been fighting in action. And yes, those are some, but the majority are not. They've never left American soil. Now, think about that. Never been in combat. Young men and women who are scared about the future that have no idea what to expect, no life experience, right? And they're scared to death in many cases. There, We have to look at this a little bit differently. And, you know, when they say 22 a day, do I think that number's higher? Yeah, I think that number's higher because once you leave the military, if you don't become a, a you know patient in the VA system, you're not tracked really anymore mm-hmm. unless something happens to you and it's put on your death certificate, right? So a lot of times we're not even tracking these appropriately. So there's a lot of things that fall through the cracks here that we could try to make better. But my job, like, you know, is to really keep names off the wall altogether and keep, you know, keep these people from dying. It's not to try to make these systems better in the process is to look at this differently. What have they, what have they found is the, that's a shocking uh, thing that I just found. I mean, you hear 22 a day Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you're saying a majority of them didn't, uh, never saw combat or never left U.S. soil. What, What are they finding out is the cause of that then? Right. They have left American soil. Well, again, it's you get you get young people. I mean, I came in when I was 18. I was scared to death. You know, I had no idea where I was going, as where I was going to be stationed. I didn't, you know, it's a scary time. You have suicides in basic training. Um, we had suicides while I was in basic training. I was really it was unnerving at an eight as an 18-year-old thinking about that and hearing those things. But again, your brain is able, you know, your brain reads into more than what is honestly happening. Now think about this. Think about someone who's going through some major life events. Things seem worse than they are. They're going through a divorce. What is a divorce? It's not just two people breaking up. It might be kids and finances and a house. And there, there's everything that starts to happen in that fatal 10 starts to snowball. These things start to pick up speed. Normally what happens though is as outsiders looking at a suicide that's happened in an agency, you only have a small piece of the pie. We think as cops that we're like best friends with the people we work with and we know everything. And I'm like, no, you don't. There is stuff they will never share with you um, out of shame, out of it's none of your business, that kind of stuff. It's personal in nature. There are things that your for, your coworkers will never share with you. And yet we believe at our core that we know them intimately. And I'll go, okay, well, you two work together. Oh yeah, we're really close. Like a when's his birthday? Oh, I don't know. When's her birthday? <laughs> no. I said, you don't, do you know their kids' names? No. 
I'm like, you don't know them intimately and you yeah. don't know what they're struggling with. And, and I think we just get caught up in the idea that we think we understand and we're able, and that's why you get all these people jumping on board now thinking that they're experts going, oh, well, we know why it happened. I'm like, listen, suicide isn't explained very easily, which is part of the problem because everybody wants an easy answer. It's a very intricate subject that you have to look at all these different vantage points and find out what was going on in their lives. And you're going to have things that you'll never know because they weren't made available or they didn't talk about it or it was secretive. So there's a lot of missing pieces. And yet everybody thinks they're an expert and everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon. And it's like, this isn't helping us right now. In fact, it's really hurting us because what you're doing is you're empowering our officers to believe that everything is job related or it's PTSD or it's just trauma. And you give them no power um, in the decisions and choices that they make. You're telling them it's okay to drink. It's okay to do drugs. It's okay to get in a domestic with your spouse. It's okay to do A, B, and C because the stress of the job has caused that. And the truth is that's not true. Right. And you're saying that all these things make you special, not special, but you make you a victim, whereas other yeah. people don't don't have that luxury and, of being and a victim. Will, and listen, and the, the point is, when you see somebody get arrested for some bad behavior or you see a child that's out at 2 a.m. carrying a loaded handgun and you're like, where's the parent? I'm like, OK, I get that. But you can't take away your responsibility here. You can't blame everything on the job and that you have stress because everybody has <laughs> stress, man. Right. See. I don't want you to be a victim because I care about your well-being and I care about what's going to happen to you. And I don't want to keep giving you this this false narrative that it's OK the way that you're acting and things that you're doing, because I don't want you to live like that. And the ones that that are telling you that it's all the job and you have no responsibility, they truly don't care about you. What they care about is your membership to their organization. And they hope you're here next year to pay your membership dues. But they don't care about you at the level that I'm going to care about you, because at that my core, my mission is to make sure that we not only save you from suicide, that we find a better way to live life. Yeah, and and the organizations, they don't want that for you. Right. And, and they may yeah. say it, but it's lip service. And until they start doing something different and allowing us to come in and bring our training in and say, listen, we know know that this is going to save lives. Like we know this is saving lives because we have the answer here. Nobody wants the solution because it stops its grant money. It stops people mm -hmm. from working in other spots. And we say, listen, we got enough here to help everybody get stuff done. And we, we're going to save lives in the process. Why do you not want this so much? I have a question. I have a lot of questions, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to touch on, cause you were saying like what you just talked about, I think this is a perfect segue. What is, this is just law enforcement. This is military. This is first responders, right? You're seeing an issue here where there, this should be the number one, I feel, like the most resources allocated to this issue, right? But where are the crossovers between this and civilian suicide, like what we're seeing? Because what you're talking about is pretty general. I mean, you know, I know people deal with like you said, law enforcement, they deal with different things than the civilians do because they see different things. But are there any crossovers between like what you're talking about and civilian suicide? Well, I think the, yeah. the outside the PTSD, the trauma, the, the bad things that cops see at work onto the civilian side, the causative factors for suicide are the same. That's what I hear well, you say. And, and listen, we're not the only ones that have PTSD and have stress. Right. Like we think that oh, we're, right. again, we think we're special. We right. have nurses and doctors and children who are, have PTSD. You know, we, we're, we're not special here. We need to stop thinking that somehow we're the only ones that have this issue. That's not true. We deal with it in the wrong way and we have easy access to firearms. So let me explain. So our fatal 10, we got called by construction because construction workers saw that this connection was, man, we have a lot of the same things going on. And we looked at construction and said, yeah, you do. Except when you die, a lot of times, yes, you use firearms, but you also jump from high places and you do certain things because you have access via your occupation and you know mm -hmm. how things work and you know that what would be deadly, right? So those are a lot of things are the same where we started venturing out. So we went in, we looked at children K through 12 and, and college age, because that's a, another group that has high suicide rates. They only have what we call the fatal five because they don't have the life experience and a lot of the other things that come into play. But we looked at veterinarians, right? We started looking at veterinarians. I wanted to be a vet when I, you know, when I grew up and I'm like, man, there's too many years of college and too many student loans. And that <laughs> it came in really handy when I was looking at this because 
There were many similarities because at our core, before we work, we are people. We have people problems. What changes is in the veterinarian field, there was a significant, just one factor alone that stood out, financial issues from student loan debt that's unable to be paid back over a course of time. It's very, I mean, it I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars that people are, you know, then we look at what risk factors do veterinarians have? Well, they have relationship issues like everybody else that work in long hours, right? They deal with death, but it's with animals. They have to euthanize animals. Sometimes they have to euthanize animals that are still healthy that the the owners don't want. Um, They struggle with that. How do they die? Well, the majority of females die by euthanasia drugs because they know how it works. And, And we see males mostly by firearm in that group. So again, the occupation, when you have the ability to have life and death, and you can sometimes be the person that dictates that, you know how those things work, and it changes how you operate. If you go into a career saying, I'm here to protect and serve, or I'm here to care for animals, and then all of a sudden you're you're having to put an animal down, and you haven't dealt with, again, that spiritual foundation of why you're here and what your purpose is, you struggle every time you have to put an animal down. I'm an animal lover. That hurts. But I also know that animals only live so long and they don't think, you know, you have to look at this differently in your mindset. You have to understand the concepts that you're working with is I love animals, but at some point my animal is going to become in, in too much pain for me to be here and be selfish about it. They don't understand what tomorrow is. They live in the mm-hmm. moment. So you have to rationalize in your mind these things that you're doing to make sense of what's going to happen so you can deal with it and, and push through it. And we don't have that ability to look at things in that way, which is why we're stuck right now. You know, like, I t- and here's a perfect example. One of the first calls I get from people, mostly men, is my my spouse, my partner, significant other is leaving me. I'm like, really? What happened? Well, they found dirty pictures on my phone or saw that I was, I was cheating with somebody online via message or whatever. I said, okay, so let me ask you a question. If, if she was, he, if she was standing behind you right now, would you be doing this? No. I said, so you know, it's wrong. Well, I guess I'm like, no, you know, it's wrong because you hid it from them, which is why you knew it was wrong. So I, so my, my brain goes to, if you knew that this could happen and the relationship could come to an end, and then you could be going through this divorce six months later, then why did you do it in the first place? And they're like, well, I didn't think about it. I'm like, well, that's the problem. You you know, the consequences are pretty predictive when you look at some of these behaviors. I can predict with some certainty what's going to happen in that relationship based on your behavior. And yet so can you, but you choose to be in denial that somehow you can blame stress or you can blame the job or you can just not get caught because you're really good. I go, why are you living like that? Right. Why are you living like that? And then when you get caught, like it's a rush for them. But then when they get caught and the world starts to crumble, then all of a sudden we have a serious problem and we're contemplating suicide. (laughs) And I see it all the time. Wow. Yep. Let's talk. Let's talk about your deadly 10. You want to list those for us and talk yeah, a little about, about, about Before we do that, can I ask one question? One more question? I know. I'm I guess sorry. I, guess I know. I'm Let's sorry, go Andy. Go ahead. I'm going to give a disclaimer this time, okay? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, do you think that we have the same issue across the board, like civilian and law enforcement, about how we approach suicide prevention, that, that you know, term? Do you think that like there's they're doing the same thing with civilian suicide that they are with first responders and everything that it's all just on the back end nothing not enough on the front end we're all focused on what what's happening after the fact yeah, that's what prevention is. Prevention is reactive and it's not working. Um, yeah, nobody you know, wants even to talk the, about it. The, we look at physicians as well. And, you know, I, I have people in the physician field that are experts on the suicide thing, but they want to blame the job on everything too. And I go, you know, we do the same thing. It's all preventative or, or reactive, excuse me. Prevention is reactive. And until we step back for a moment and look at the fact that we don't need to be in crisis all the time, we're going to have people in crisis Um, Because you can't get to everybody. Not everybody wants help. You're going to miss people. They're going to fall through the cracks. But if you can inoculate, and it's the idea is for us is inoculate sooner than later, meaning the sooner we can get to you, your grandchildren, your children. These are the young people when we look 10, 15 years out, like we did our research, we got published. And when we looked, we said, well, listen, who's going to be getting hired in 10 or 15 years? A bunch of children that have mental health issues right now because of COVID and social media and and all this other stuff going on, bullying. I said, so that's the group that we need to be looking at now to inoculate them against the issues that they're going to face growing up for their for their age, for their race, their gender, their ethnicity, the group that they're in, their occupational group, which is students at that point. We need to inoculate them as they continue to grow through life at the issues that they're going to face so that when they do face them, because they will face them, it's not that they won't face any kind of issue, 
But when they do face them, they have the right tools, skills, and resources available to use those ahead of time before these problems become really significant and impact their life. You know, you're born over here and you pass away over here. It's a continuum. And on that continuum, we have a lot of things that happen in our lives, good and bad. But suicide, you know, it's really for us now, it's kind of taken a back burner because the idea is we don't want to get to that point. You know, you get a you get a guy or a gal in here that's got a drinking problem, and the next thing you know, they're making bad decisions and they're being sexually promiscuous outside the relationship that they're in, and all of a sudden they have a DUI. I can predict with some certainty how bad this is gonna be. And and yet people see this every day in their agencies. They see the stuff going on and they go, We didn't know that it was this bad. And then they have me come to the suicide. I'm like, I'm like, how did you not know this was this bad? You're telling me that this individual was hooked on an ex that they cheated on them, that there was a breakup, that they had a serious drug problem, that their parents called them every night from one job to the next to make sure that they were okay because something wasn't right. They had birthday presents and Christmas presents that hadn't been unwrapped in over a year. They had lost a bunch of weight. Their personality had changed completely. And yet you sit here amazed that this happened. I'm like, Hmm. like Hmm. how much more information you guys knew something was wrong because you called me, right? But you wait until after the person dies by suicide and then you want me to come in and do something for your agency. When I gave you my number, I've had a case where the guy had my cards in his wallet. His parents called me and said, are you seeing my son? And I thought, my God, I'm married. No, what are you talking about? They said, no, it's his doctor on your card. I go, listen, I do research. He was in my class. And, and, you know, we're, we're, you know, when, and I remember back to that class because I was friends with this individual and I remember back to that class and there was an individual sitting right next to this guy and he was an ass the whole class. He didn't want to be there. He retired in a week. He didn't need to be there. And he interrupted my class so much that I stopped the class. And I said, I didn't ask you to be here. And if you want to leave, you are more than welcome to leave. But if you keep interrupting my class, I will make you leave. And he sat there. And the next time I saw this guy I was at the other guy's funeral about a week later. Mm-hmm. So it's like if we would just stop for a moment and look around and see the people around us and realize what they're dealing with and what we don't know about and stop because we get caught up in our own stuff. We get caught, you know, everybody says, oh, um, I'd rather talk to you for hours and go to your funeral. I'm like, really? Because if the problem isn't solved in three to four minutes, you're done. So so I, I that that stuff's all lip service, guys. That That's all these new slogans. Let's smash the stigma. Let's do this. And like, that's all lip service. That, listen, that doesn't do anything for anybody and it doesn't change anything. And we know the truth is that as humans, there is a stigma behind seeking mental health. Number one, because nothing is standardized for us. If there was one number that everybody had to call and we knew that when we called that, there was no punitive things that followed that. And we knew exactly one, two, three, what was going to happen. We would do that. But there's nothing standardized. And in many agencies, they pick and choose how you get help. If they like you, hey, if they like you, they're going to cover this up a little bit. They're going to keep you under their wing. They're going to make sure they take care of you and no one will know about it. But if they don't, good luck. Hmm. And that's part of the problem, too. There are so many factors going on here um, that it's just really difficult to try to address, especially as one group, you know, as one group trying to figure this out and then not trying to piss everybody off on the way because we're not that's not what we're trying to do. We just say, listen, guys, if you want to keep giving condolences, then keep giving condolences. But I'm tired of it. The status quo is killing us. And if you can't see it for what it is, then you're part of the problem. I think we should get past the point of worrying about pissing people off. Yeah, That's exactly. what we should do anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Andy asked about the fatal 10. I'd, I'd like to get back to that. What, what are the fatal 10? So it's interpersonal relationships is leading the way. That's number one. And that's for anyone along with substance mm-hmm. use and addiction issues stress and trauma, either childhood along the way or job related, right? Sleep issues, mental health issues, physical health issues, access to firearms for cops, right? And that's not the only way that they die, but the majority and most of them are duty weapon, Uh, being under investigation, pending or nearing retirement, and then kind of a catch-all as other major life events. So I had three or four guys that dropped papers the same day they took their life. Now, everybody goes, oh, my gosh. I go, listen, you got to look at this differently. Just because they were near, you know, retirement age or shortly thereafter doesn't mean it was the retirement. You've got to look a little bit deeper. So one of them had actually had a party the night before and was handing out letters to people, right? At the time, they probably weren't putting two and two together, Mm -hmm. didn't think much of it. um, But he was saying goodbye. Uh, Some of the other ones, there were significant issues with, like, financial issues like debt, medical debt, medical issues with family members, a lot happens when you get ready to retire. You know, you're you're as an individual, 
going through this loss of not having this identity anymore and not being accepted anymore and not getting to get all the information anymore. And then you're transitioning back into a family where you're going to be spending majority of your time. And I always say, if you don't have something to do when you retire, you better because your family is not going to be able to to tolerate you the first week you're there because everybody wants to go fishing and they're going to be gone and they're going to do A, B, and C. And the truth is I'll check back with them and they haven't done anything but lay on the couch Mm. and and feel sorry for themselves for a little bit. For the first couple of weeks, they're actually enjoying themselves. And then it's like, now what? So they don't have a plan. Their purpose is changing and they didn't prepare for it. That's Andy right there. That, 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 was, that was me for sure after I retired. Yeah. That was Andy's story. It was. Well, there's a lot of things in there, and I like what you said earlier, and, I, and you do. You see everybody blame everything on PTSD. And I wish I could find the – it was Lassiter that told me. I wish he could give me the, the things. And you may be able to expound on this, but you talk about military guys, you know, 22 a day. They have this high level of PTSD. They deploy overseas. They go to combat zones, blah, blah, blah. But you have law enforcement officers that deploy every day in their own backyard to go do a similar job, deal with death, destruction, mayhem, chaos, de- uh, other horrible, people's problems, you know, other people's problems. And sometimes they internalize all of these. I know I did. Um, and I think the thing was that a law enforcement officer of any length of time, 20 year career, whatever, it equates to like eight different deployments. All right. So you. And we, and we and here's another thing that we have to be really careful of, too. And I tell people, you know, we we talk about law enforcement as this one entity and that we all see death, mayhem and destruction every day. And the truth is, that's not true. Right. Um, there are a majority of agencies that don't see anything day mm-hmm. after day after day. It's simple calls. There, there may be a difference between like you get a large agency, let's like let's say Chicago PD, where you mm-hmm. might get calls and violence on a daily basis in certain agencies and certain groups. In the smaller group, the rural agencies, you may get those people that you know intimately, their family members, their friends, right? Mm-hmm, they're either yeah. people that you know. So there's many differences. And and I think everybody thinks that every day we're going out and we're we're mm-hmm. shooting, we're like mm-hmm. shooting at people and we're having gunfights and we're <laughs> we're witnessing, but maybe collectively across the nation, there are these things happening, but not to every cop. And that's part of the problem too, is mm-hmm we want to try to rationalize that they're seeing all this bad stuff. And, and that's just not true. Yeah. And we keep saying that over and over again, and we blanket that. And then everybody keeps like collectively saying that. Um, but the truth is that's not happening every single day in this country. Um, and, and when we do that, it kind of skews how people see us. It, it doesn't, it doesn't give to the realities of what we're really dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. So I try to be careful with that as well. It sounds like the powers that be have used this blanket PTSD to cover everything is what it, what it sounds like. It, yeah. And, and you, you know what we started realizing from our research is that these adverse childhood experiences, which is these ACEs that, that we talk about, they are very key here when we talk about suicide. And why I say that is because our research is actually turning up the fact that we have young men and women who come into a career that had past trauma, and sometimes they want to make things right. Sometimes they want to get that power back and feel like they are doing something worthwhile, and they don't take care of the trauma that they had initially. So that trauma gets buried, and as they're working, they, they start working, and everything seems great. What happens is they get triggered somewhere along the line, but they can't relate it back to that initial trauma as a child. It now becomes what is causing is caused by the job, right? So that mm-hmm. that's easy to see how they're doing it, how they're making that rationalization. But the truth is, is that we have a lot of people in this country, not just cops, but people in this country who have traumas from childhood and bad stuff happening that have never dealt with that on any level. And when you are reintroduced to trauma and stress at the level that we are at times, it can trigger it without knowing or understanding what it is. And then when you don't understand and you just know something isn't right and you don't feel right and you can't share it because you don't know what the hell is going on. Like I've had no big issues. I've had no major calls. And yet I'm spiraling down this deep, dark circle. What do I do? I'm going to go drink Hmm. because I know that at least I feel somewhat normal doing that. And it masks the pain and it makes me fit in with everybody else that's doing it. And I can do that for a while. The problem is that when you use those coping mechanisms long term, they have their own side effects and you'll start seeing it in the changes in their mental health because alcohol use, heavy alcohol use changes. It changes who you are and your personality. It also starts giving you physical issues, right? It starts having relationship problems. You're not sleeping right. All of a sudden that fatal 10, you start chalking up these 10 and you're like, oh my God, I've had people go, listen, Olivia, 
I'm having a great life. And yet I looked at your fatal 10 and I have like nine of the 10 factors on here. And now that I, and I mean, I've literally had people do that that didn't think that they were at risk. And they're like, holy cow, I didn't realize I had this many of these factors. And I said, and these factors are much deeper than just the surface level, right? They're much deeper, but it's just explained very easily with this, this chart that we have. But I said, man, we've got a lot of people in this country hurting who are masking their hurt with drugs, alcohol, gambling, shopping, sex, whatever, whatever vice they want to use or vices. And then once those vices don't work anymore or they lead to other issues, now we're actually accelerating their risk for bad outcomes. Hmm. Yeah, it is kind of scary because, I, I mean, you mentioned all these things in the, in the Fatal Ten and not to bring up anything that, I, you know, I've talked about it on a previous episode. I got a lot of them. Yeah. And I did, you know, and I had an incident. Uh, I've never been suicidal. Well, I, I say I've never been suicidal. I don't believe I've ever been suicidal, but I had an incident where it almost happened one night and I didn't realize it. And it was a very alcohol induced evening. Um, and that's a story I've talked about before. I'm not going to get into it, but uh, when I look back, it, yeah. Okay. Have, do we have PTSD? I probably have some level of it. I do um, as Andy probably does as well. Um, but we can't blame it on all that. It was choices that I made and a hundred percent. I know that everything, I mean, I chose to get myself to the level that I was, you know, I could sit there and blame it on whatever I wanted to blame it on, but it, it, it is what it is. But I mean, that's kind of scary when you look at this, you're like, wow. Um, you know, and I that's deal- assuming that's assuming that like you take that and you go, man, my life's going really great right now. Right. And, and I go, yeah, but here's the problem. My life's going great right now, too. But guess what? It only takes the blink of an eye for something bad to happen. It takes one knock at the door. It takes somebody saying they're leaving. It takes somebody finding something on your computer, on your phone, an argument. Um, It it takes one thing to disrupt everything in your life. And right now, you might be juggling those 10 factors, right? And you're doing okay and everything's okay because life is really, it's, it's not static. It's always moving. It takes one thing to upset that cart. And, and like I said, it's assuming that you're doing well right now. And, mm-hmm. and if you are, and then something happens and you're not prepared for it to happen, you know, I, I tell them, I said, listen, I, I make people write down the top three people in their life in my training, I write down the top three people and in the, in the order of their importance. And, and I go now halfway through the class, I said, someone's coming off your list. They're not returning. And they're like, I'm not, I no, I'm not taking them off the list. I said, listen, you don't get that choice. Mm-hmm. See, if you can't deal with the fact that somebody in your life is going to die because they will right? It's not if, it's when. People are going to come off your list. You're going to come off the list at some point. But if you're not prepared to deal with it on paper, how in the heck are you going to deal with it in real life? Because people do pass away. And we've got to have this idea of we're not like these super, I love my my guys and gals and they're they're superheroes to me, but in real life, they're, they're not, they're just as human as anybody else. But we can't deal with this stuff that's going on and we can't deal with it in the classroom setting. We're not dealing with it appropriately in the real life setting. And that's the problem. So you were talking about you're talking about one single event, you know, changing everything. And it leads me back to thinking about Chad Kinney. Yeah. Uh, this was a law enforcement suicide. <clears throat> this guy, uh, I was his sergeant on night shift. Uh, he and I would work out frequently together in the in the police department gym, you know, when things slowed down at, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning. And before you go any farther, and this is one of those guys that everybody said, you know, man, I can't believe it. he's a yeah, good guy. Uh, good guy. <clears throat> good yeah. dude. I mean, if I could if I could if I could have had ten Chad Kenny's on my shift, I would have I would have been set. He's just a just a super, super guy. And later on after I'd gotten elected sheriff and I was in bed one night, probably eleven o'clock or so, and I got a call and they said, um, Chad Kenny just committed suicide. And I, I said, no, they said Corporal Kenny. Yeah. And I said, well, Corporal Kenny, okay. And I'm trying to come out of this fog. I'm, you know, just got good asleep. And uh, Corporal Kenny, and then they said, yeah, Chad Kenny. I said, Chad Kenny? Like that? And they said, yeah. And it turns out that he had, uh, I think maybe some drugs, some prescription drugs and some alcohol might have been involved. And then then uh, had, had domestic a issues, domestic yeah. issue at the house. Uh, from what I understand, he kissed his two-year-old son on the head and said, I love you, walked outside and stuck a glock behind his ear and pulled the trigger. Yeah. And uh, it was gone just like that. And this mm-hmm. guy was a super great guy, great cop, uh, a guy that you'd kick a door in and, and go anywhere with and seemed like he had everything together, never got upset, never showed any emotion on a call or anything, just calm, cool, and collective, and then just... Just like that, and he's gone. It goes back to what you said. We never really knew the deep problems that no. they were there, you know? 
Well, and you know, that domestic issue is a huge one. You know, um, Mm. we we try not to talk about that either, especially when we talk law enforcement and first responders. But the truth is we have issues with domestic abuse. You know, you don't have a murder suicide and not have any issues in that home. You don't go one day and have one argument and then both people are dead. It doesn't work like that. (laughs) Um, And in addressing that and talking about it, um, it's something, again, it's one of those dirty little secrets that we don't want to talk about. But you put alcohol in that mix and you get two people that might have an argument over something and it escalates. We know that oftentimes when you have a domestic and people have to come to the home, that it's a deal breaker, which means mm-hmm. that you're not doing what you wanted to be doing. Your purpose is now in jeopardy. Your relationship is now in jeopardy. And like I said, that fatal 10 comes down to what we call relational purpose. Every relationship has a purpose. Right. And every purpose that you have has relationships in it. And what happens is when those two come together, they synergize either positively or negatively. If both of those are in jeopardy now, they already know they're losing their job and they're probably losing the relationship. They immediately go to it's almost like the switch in their brain. And I had wrote this down earlier. I was trying to be able to articulate it a little bit. It's like when the mind has overridden the body's desire to live. It's like this idea that it's an all or nothing. We have a black and white dichotomous minds that we're very rigid in our thinking. And we immediately go to I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my marriage. It's that quick. Hmm. Right. And we don't think anything past it. And I say, listen, maybe you will go to maybe you will go to jail. Maybe you will lose your job and maybe you will lose your marriage. But guess what? You do not need to lose your life. Have Mm. you been in a relationship before? Yes. Will you go into another one? Possibly. You have to be here, though. And your son, you know, that little boy, he deserved better. Right. He, He needed him here. And and again, I tell people, don't make this an all or nothing. Mm. Will people not like you? Will they think that you made bad decisions? Sure. But who who cares? Like, listen, they don't get it. They don't get a decision or a a say in your life when when you're doing what you need to be doing. You have to to recalibrate for a moment. Take yourself back out of the position. You're not going to be doing this job forever. You're going to at some point you're going to age out. You're going to retire. Something's going to happen. You're not doing this job forever. This relationship may not last forever. This marriage may not last forever. But it does not mean that you are able to make a decision that will affect many other people when you could step back for a moment and make some better choices. And that's exactly what it is. It's better choices. All right. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. Okay. Because like uh, Thomas said, you have so much information on this and you you seem very passionate about it. And we've talked about the causes or what we believe are the causes. We've talked about the problems. And I think that the solution that you, I hope you give right here is going to be something that could be applied to everybody, not just law enforcement, not just military, not just first responders, everybody out there. Yes. So having talked about all the stuff we've already talked about, let's talk about the solution to, to, to really decrease the numbers or even stop it. I mean, yeah. you're never going to stop it all the way, but let's talk about right. the solution. What is the solution? The solution is our inoculation paradigm. You know, it, it starts the earlier we can start inoculating people against these issues that they have. And, and the fatal 10, we've done enough of these um, different occupational groups and, and age groups that we know that many of the issues are the same. We have relationship issues, right? It, it, that's the foundation of who we are as people as relationships. So what we're doing is we go, look, we've done enough of this research and we've done enough, you know, pulling of these documents and looking at all of this information that we need to inoculate people against the things that they are going to face. What does that mean? We talk to them early about relationships. Instead of telling me that your agency doesn't have any money unless it's an active shooter class, it's an EBOC class, or you know something really fun, put money in some of your relationship classes. I mean, you probably get a third tactical or something in front of it to make people go, but you can do the right kind of class to talk about de-escalation training and doing those things in the home and how you talk to other people and how you can not have fights in your house and how you cannot have arguments that will go for months and months and months. And then they will literally, they will start escalating over time. And then you throw alcohol in there. You need to start educating people on the risk factors that they face and how they can get ahead of those risk factors so they don't have serious problems in their life. And the earlier you do that, that that means that like if you start with a young person, right, seventh, eighth grade, you start talking to them about, you know, this fatal 10 idea and that these are things that are going to happen to you as you grow up. You might get bullied. You might have this happen. You might have this happen. You get in front of them to where they start to practice these skills that you're giving them on a day to day basis where they become really good at using them and they know where they're at. And they know how to they know how to get to them when they need them. So they're not unprepared. 
And when we have people that are adults, right, we have adults taking their lives. How do we expect children to get through this when they don't have the same set of tools, skills and resources? Mm -hmm. So we've got to do something different. And what that is, is inoculation. Listen to me. I don't care if you consider yourselves, you know, the blue lives or this. and that. Every life to us matters. Every family matters, because if you're not one of those people, you're dealing with them in the community when you work. They all matter. And they, they could be a problem for you later on. And we don't want you to have to keep going to calls where you're seeing suicides and bad stuff happen. If we can eliminate that, we eliminate the trauma that you're exposed to. So inoculation is the key, starting them early. You know, we still have to keep up some of the prevention things that they're doing. People won't stop doing that. But it takes a, a literally a village, if you will, in a different vantage point from people to do things differently. And it's not it's not the same old thing. It's not the going to every conference and everybody shares a story, you know, um, Listen, everybody has a story and there's a place for that. But right now we need to get ahead of this and we need to make sure that we're saving lives in record numbers. That's what we need to be doing right now. And we need to put that other stuff on the back burner for a moment. And we need to come together as a collective and say, this is not, you know, this is not okay. The status quo is killing us and we're ready to do something different. Something that I think it sounded like a solution that you also talked about in talking about the problem is we also have to stop saying they were such a great person. Like there's no way that could have, you know what I mean? Like there's this, this belief I think in our lives. Okay. Well, here's a, here's to me what I've seen as a pastor, I'll even say, cause this really does cross over so much with what, you know, trying to inoculate, right. Is the idea. Yes. Um, something that is so difficult for people to understand and do because it takes work and it's hard and you don't think about it being hard, but it is, being intentional in your relationships with people. Intentionality is such an important part of life and it's so hard. And I see the issue even in churches where all of the intentionality relationships is passed off to the pastor. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the same in law enforcement mm -hmm. where, hey, you're the one that's supposed to care about your, your like the police chief or the sheriff or whoever, you're the one mm -hmm. that's gotta take care of the relationships. You know, where it's like, I'm just here to do a job, you know, like, how is that also something? Is there a way I, I want to be like, do small groups within law enforcement, military, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like get people around each other to be intentional with each other, to know each other well so that they can and, and stop ignoring those moments where it's like, hey, you just had a, a rough night or you just had a, you, you, you're doing some things that aren't healthy. You know, like that seems to also be a lot of that too. I think right? what that's you're trying that. to say is people need to start it's as early holding as, people accountable. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really, yeah, that's what it sounds yourself, like you're saying. And, and it is about, we, we actually use that word intentional in my training. I make them write it down because <laughs> everything is a choice. And if you're not intentional, you're making a choice by not making a choice. So it's like about, it's about making, you know, the, the, the thing that you want to do, it has to be on the top of your list, right? If, if you're a priority or it's a priority, you're going to do it. If it's not, you just it just isn't important enough to you. And I make our chiefs and sheriffs, I actually hold them accountable for knowing literally everybody in their agency and knowing their top three. I actually challenge them to do that. Because when you have a problem in that top three group, you're going to have a problem with the individual at work. There's going to, something's going to happen. Um, and, it, and it is about relationships. That, that is going to the wayside. Um, I said recently in a class I was teaching up in Michigan, and I made the comment. It was a bunch of EMTs, and they were amazing. I said, who do you think calls me when I'm having a bad day? I was like, nobody. Number one, I don't put it out there I'm having a bad day, but nobody would know, right? And and, and if they did, they're not calling me. They, they I mean, it, they're too busy with their own stuff, right? Now, if I, if I died or I did something bad, and the next day they'd be like, man, why didn't she call me? It's like, why didn't you call me? Like, I, I reach out to everybody, right? But when I'm having a bad day, there's not one person that reaches out to me. And, um, and this guy actually reached out after he reached out about a week ago and he says, Hey, I wanted to check on you. How are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, I re he said, I purposely remembered you made that statement in class that nobody checks on you. And I was like, Holy shit. Like, that's cool. <laughs> well, I said, you know, actually I said, Hey, I just had surgery today, man. I really appreciate that. I had surgery on my hand. I really appreciate you reaching out. And, um, that meant a lot to me because, you know, people close to me, I mean, my husband wouldn't know if I'm having a bad day. Like I, I don't share stuff at that level, but I'll tell you this. I don't share stuff at that level with other people because number one, I don't want to burden them and they have their own problems. But you know, my, my foundation and, and, you know, Jesus Christ is, is my foundation. So I know that even if I lose in life or something happens to me, I know exactly where I'm going. So for me, that's the inoculation piece for me. That's, that's the key. 
So I can, I, I could go to work. I could go out in public. Something bad could happen. And I may not be here tomorrow. I may not be here later today. I'm okay with that because I've made peace with where I'm going. So for me, that's right. my inoculation. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, like I said early on, you know, I, I love people and I want them to have the best life. Damn it. They deserve it. They work hard for this. They deserve to enjoy what they've worked so hard for. And sadly, we're all struggling to get through this. And I'm like, man, we can make it easier here. We can make life easier. We can help you make better decisions. And listen, I've made dumb decisions. I've done stupid stuff. But guess what? Life is not just about making good decisions everywhere you go. We, we have to do those things and stumble so that we know exactly where we're going and we, we learn how to do things differently in the future. And, and I tell anybody, listen, I don't care what you get in trouble for. I don't care what you do. I will walk beside you if that's what you want. I'll walk beside you with whatever's going to happen to you. I can't guarantee the outcome. But again, we all make mistakes and we need to stop you know, canceling each other out and canceling ourselves out when we do something wrong, thinking it's an all or nothing because it's not. Um, it may be the reason that you're here is to tell somebody else and share your story eventually with somebody else on how to get through. It's all about human connection. And you, you nailed it. It's, it's all about relationships and human connection. And that's where we're failing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Olivia, let's talk a little bit about uh, now before we run out of time here sure. a little bit. But let's talk about shepherds and sheepdogs. And let's <laughs> talk about what, what's your goal with shepherds and sheepdogs? Uh, how did shepherds and sheepdogs come to be? And, and what are your goals for the future? What are your plans? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, so about three or four years ago, I had been praying about the whole suicide thing. I'm like, you know, God, just give me a give me an answer here. What am I supposed to be doing with the, the research? What am I supposed to be doing? And as clear as day, it, it was it was shepherds and sheepdogs. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to go write that down before I forget it, because <laughs> my attention span can be real short sometimes. Yeah. And I sat with mm-hmm. this it. been three or four years since I came up with that and had it trademarked. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? And um, we recently turned it into an organization and we are actually having our our first annual Shepherds and Sheepdog Summit coming to Orlando in May 12th through 14th of 2025. And this is different than any other kind of summit or conference you'll go to. And why that is, is because we're taking people from all disciplines. We're looking at people from the clergy side of the house, clinicians, administrators, first responders, family members, peer support, a whole whole group of people that have different vantage points on wellness, health, and safety. And, And it's all of that. Because if you're at work and you're not safe, you're not healthy, and you're not well, And if you're not healthy and well, you're not safe. So it all kind of goes together. And we said, listen, we need these new cutting edge things. We're bringing in evidence and research-based stuff. We're looking at our fatal 10. We're we're going out from there and saying, listen, we need to inoculate. And the whole conference is based on that inoculation paradigm is it's not the same old, same old. You're not going to get there and go, here's the signs and symptoms. We know that. We just don't know what to do with that information once we have it. And we're afraid to be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. And and trust me, I will pull somebody aside if I think there's something wrong and I will call you out and I will get you assistance. But we're afraid to do that because we don't want to upset people and we don't want to have somebody not like us. Um, I'm okay with that. I I don't, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to get you home at night. That's my job. And, and sometimes you don't like people because the truth is people don't want to hear the truth. Sometimes I don't want to hear the truth. Sometimes I'm just as human as anybody else. And I make mistakes, but damn it. I want somebody that has enough in them to say, listen, I see something isn't right here and I want to help you. And that's what we're going to do. We want to take this three days and we want to love on people and we want to make them, you know, get whatever they can get out of this summit. And we want them to come back. We want this to be an annual thing where we bring in some of the best practices and we start not only reducing numbers, but reducing them in record number. Um, we know we can't eliminate suicide, you know, all across the board because it's going to happen and people are going to pass away um, regardless of the cause of death. But we know that we can educate them at a different at a different level and with some new stuff that we haven't been doing for a long time in law enforcement, which is research. We don't do enough of it. Yeah. Well, I know you're available for speaking engagements and uh, doing classes. Uh, you're going up to Breaching the Barricade in Indiana coming up in October with Jim Bontrager. Uh, I'll tell you what, that that event I went to last year, I've been like I did 30 years in law enforcement, and I'd never been to an event quite like that one. Uh, whenever I got invited to speak up there last year, you're you're really going to enjoy that. Yeah, trip. and I've heard yeah. that from several people. <laughs> I am super excited to be going to that. Yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a great experience. You want to give people uh, your contact info and let's talk about your social media platforms and where you can be contacted and, uh, you know, what what you're available for. Yeah. No. um, And your book. You You got a book. Yeah. Yeah. You got a book too, right? 
Yeah. And yeah, and you know what? Um, your followers, um, they can reach out and I will send you the e-copy if they request sure. it. You can give it to them for free. Um, we want we want the word to get out. I don't make any money off this book. Um, uh, we want the we want the information out there so people can use it. So we'll make sure we get that to them. But um, you can Google the Blue Wall Institute and you can find my contact information. Uh, my cell phone is 618-791-9146. I, I open that up to anybody when I'm out training as well. If you need anything, we'll help you. Um, and, you know, you can search Shepherds and Sheepdogs on all of our, we have Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, X, I guess it is now, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm out there, you know, um, I'm very, I, I'm very reachable, if you will. I'm always, I always want to make sure that I can get to the people and that they can get to me because that's really important to us. Um, so, you know, this is all about, you know, improving the quality of life for the individuals that put their lives on the line. And, and we, you know, that's what we want to do and we want to make it a great event and we appreciate anything that, you know, we can get out there. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, this has been a great episode today. Oh, yeah. I, very, uh, very dynamic. And I think the most exciting thing about this episode today was hearing you tell us that a lot has been wrong with the way that we've been approaching law enforcement suicides 100%. and suicides yeah. in, in general, basically. You know, do you, let me ask you this real quick. This crossed my mind a little while ago. What, what do you think about, we we're talking about inoculation and we, we do a lot of stress inoculation mm-hmm. in law enforcement by, uh, training with simunition rounds, uh, people getting struck, uh, you know, f- actual doing, doing ground fighting and those kind of things. But what, what do you think it figures into is about how someone was raised and how they were trained or how they saw their parents handling problems? And does the poor pitiful me uh, syndrome come into effect there? Now, you kind of cut out on me a little bit there, Andy. Could you repeat that last little bit? Yeah. What about, you know, do you think there are people out there that uh, does the poor pitiful me syndrome kind of figure into some of these suicides? Everybody's against me, poor pitiful me, nothing goes right for me, and it's always somebody else's fault too? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of times I think that they just don't feel like they have options or they've talked themselves into not having any options um, or have done so many things that kind of push them in a corner, if you will, and they start seeing suicide as a viable option. Uh, sometimes they don't want to face the consequences of the behavior. And I always mm-hmm. say, if you can't face the consequences of the behavior, you should reconsider the behavior, right? If you, right. I, you know, I ask them if, if you're, if your significant others listed as number one on your top three and you're sexting other women, then there's a conflict here because what you're telling me is not the truth. There's a conflict in what you're telling me. So if your number one over here isn't truly your number one, then either you're lying about that or you're lying about what you're doing. They can't, they can't, come together and they can't be in the same space. So if you're not willing to risk that relationship, then you shouldn't be doing the behavior that puts the relationship at risk. And right. and plain and simple, a lot of times they don't want to hear it. And I said, man, you guys will complain about going to training. It's not the training that you want. It's not fun, but you'll drive across the state to have an affair. I said, isn't that funny, man? You'll go six times yeah. a week to go do that because that's fun and exciting. <laughs> I said, yeah. We got to change that up. We got we to gotta look at ourselves. We got to take accountability for our behavior and understand why we do what we do. And we got to make it right. You're saying we've got to start working on the moral code and pointing that moral compass in the right direction. Hey, yeah. And sometimes maybe it wasn't there in the first place or we've allowed right. it to deviate a little bit because we think yeah. that the role that we have somehow gives us special privilege and it doesn't. And we kind right. of get that mindset sometimes that we're kind of above the law when the truth is we're not. Everyone, everyone is really, you know, has to hold that that line. So we got to bring that moral compass back to where it needs to be. It doesn't mean that, you know, that it can't be fixed by any means. It doesn't mean that at all. But you have to be cognizant of it. When you lose sight of the moral compass altogether, that's when we're going to have problems. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, it's uh, this has been a dynamic episode today. I think uh, people will glean a lot out of this episode when they when they listen to it. I think there's a tremendous amount of resources there. And Thomas, uh, he'll put that e link to the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, on the show notes to me through the email. Um, that'd be great. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely put that out there, but, uh, our podcast is growing and, uh, you know, we just want to, if we can only, you know, we've said this before, we look at our analytics and we get excited sometimes about <laughs> seeing the number of people that are listening to our podcast and following us and that kind of thing. But, you know, really our goal here and, and, and you know, we pray to God about this. If we do a thousand episodes and we only reach one person, uh, for Jesus Christ, 
then right. we've done we've done what we're supposed to do. We've been faithful to do what we're called to do here. And if we could just reach one person, I think we're reaching more. But if we can just reach one person, then we've I done we are we've, yeah. we've done what we're supposed to do. But uh, and it's not us. It's, it's none of us. We give all the glory to God for this podcast and for its purpose and for His mission and for His glory. And it's it's guests like you that we have on this on this podcast that really bring uh, the meat and the potatoes to what we're trying to do here today. And we, we really appreciate you being on today with us and uh, we look forward to maybe having you back again. Can I get you to talk about one thing real quick before sure. we end, because we are running a little bit low, uh, long on time. Sure. We've talked about, you said things are relationships. All right. Can we expound on the number one relationship that's going to help, help all of it? That the number, number one, one the issue? number one relationship that's going to help all of this issue here. And well, it's all not of it's going to be Jesus Christ. That's going to be right. the number exactly. one. That's what <laughs> I want to hear. Number two is going to be the relationship that you're in, not only with yourself, but your significant other partner spouse. Yeah. Um, those are the, those are the real, you know, the real issues that we're facing in life right now. Um, it, you know, it's, it all centers around relationship and we've got to start taking better care of ourselves, each other and our families. Yeah. Well, people need to realize, too, even if they have a very close personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that you're going to have an easy life either. He never promised us an easy life. He just promised us that he would always be with us through it all. Yes. We put him first. That's right. So, And listen, people will always let us down, too. And that's another reason why, you know, my my faith comes in. People are people and they are going to fall and struggle and they're going to let us down and they're not going to call you when you need help. Right. Um, So you just got to stay focused on and, and redirect that moral compass in your purpose and really get back on track and we, we can help you do that awesome i, I you have said some stuff today I, I i'm just i'm really stoked you put it out there in a way that i mean you 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 question the narrative that everybody says you know hey it's it's because of this you're telling the truth yeah. i love that i think it's great yeah. I'm, I'm i really thank you for coming on the show today thank you so hey, much Hey, i appreciate you guys so much i thank you for the platform thank, thank you. you anytime